Make It Right, the manufacturing podcast. Albert Einstein is widely credited with saying, the definition of insanity is doing the same thing over and over again, but expecting different results. Even if you realize you keep making the same mistakes, yet you don't deliberately change some things, you'll probably keep repeating those mistakes. What if there was a way to learn the things you should avoid and at the same time learn things you should repeat because they've helped you succeed? Well, there is a way. And that's why my guest today believes companies should be investing time in lessons learned and knowledge management by going through a simple process of gathering and cataloging the lessons learned from projects, tasks, and activities, and then sharing and embedding that knowledge and alternative approaches into the way they go about their business. With over 30 years of experience in manufacturing and global operations, having led companies and worked internationally with supply chains across time zones and cultures, Sam Yankelevich is also a speaker, an author, and a LinkedIn learning instructor for global projects and operations. He's a busy guy, and I'm really glad, Sam, to have you back on the podcast. Thanks for joining us again. Oh, thank you, Janet. Great to connect with you again. This is a great opportunity. Thanks. Well, it's, it's great to have you. And you know what they say, right? Hindsight is twenty twenty. So in your 30 plus years of manufacturing, have you seen companies collecting and cataloging the positive and negative lessons that they've learned from projects? And are they keeping that information available for future reference? Actually, yes, I've, I've seen some, uh, Janet. So I've seen some larger, very well-managed uh, co companies that actually have this um, clearly defined in their strategy for growth. Uh, and and, it, it, and it, it actually ties back to the way that they grow exponentially uh, that differs with, with others. Often the smaller, mid-sized companies that grow organically, uh, that are focused more into the day-to-day, -day, that don't have that in there in the strategy, that's you know one of the one of the key reasons they are smaller and, and often don't grow as fast. Um, I, I have to say also that even those that uh, that I mentioned that do have this, they they focus a lot on the technical know-how, on their technical know-how, on the intellectual property, uh, and capturing that kind of stuff. But I I I still think that there's an opportunity for even additional growth for every company when they start capturing lessons learned with uh, behaviors and cultural things like, you know, what values and mindsets are present when things are going well and vice versa, what mindsets, what behaviors, what, what's the communication processes that are happening when things are actually not going well. So there is a lot of this happening. There is a lot of this capturing happening, but there's still a lot to be done actually. So it's, it's, it is a challenge and it's a good challenge. Mm -hmm. So I'm guessing that some of these smaller companies don't do it just simply because they, they don't think that they should or they don't even realize that they should. Is that the case? Uh, uh, yeah, I've seen a lot of different reasons. You know, um, typically, the, the, one of the biggest reasons I hear is, oh, we don't have time to do this. You know, uh, they believe when they're saying that, that only uh, when they're taking action, when they're doing things is, is when they're adding value. Uh, I've heard from some of these that saying, you know, just talking about this is like not doing work. Uh, in in some uh, companies, I've been told by, you know, depending on the internal culture, they say, you know, just talking about mistakes can only create trouble for people. Um, and others, you know, this typical thing, this is not my job. And they say, well, you know, capturing lessons learned is not my job. But I, I think that the number one reason I would say is that leadership in those companies is not asking the complete, uh, you know, to have the complete picture. They're not asking all of the questions. If leadership doesn't make this a priority and if, it, if leadership doesn't make this important, uh, then it's just not gonna happen because, you know, day-to-day -day, uh, stuff is just gonna take over. It's, uh, you know, the busy, the busy work. So, um, so, you know, those are, the, those are the typical things. And uh, what I tell, what I tell everybody, I said, you know, you got to shift from we don't have time to do it to this. We don't have time not to do it. And that's really the, the you know, the, the, the shift that uh, people start to see. Uh, so share a uh, story about why you think this is so important. Uh, oh, well, uh, since I, I think you're in Canada, right? Janet? Yes, I, I am. Have, I yeah. think there's a, there's a story. Actually, there's a story about two, uh, two hunters in Canada. 
if you care to hear to hear that. I do. Um, <laughs> they hired, a, you know, these two hunters, they smiled, they, they hired a small uh, propeller plane to take them to a remote area of Canada. The pilot drops them off and he tells them, remember, eh, only moose, only one moose, because the plane has a weight limitation, eh? And uh, we can't take off with you, uh, with both of you, and more weight than that. So, you know, so there was a weight limitation. He's telling that. So the hunters go off hunting, and the you know the plane takes off. A few days later, the plane returns to pick them up, and the pilot notices the two hunters are standing by two moose. So the pilot confirmed to them and say, "I told you guys, only one moose. You'll have to leave one, eh? Otherwise, we won't be able to take off. You know." And uh, so one of the hunters responds, hey, you're just a chicken. Last year, the pilot that brought us let us take two moose on the plane. Then after some arguing, the pilot allows them to bring the two moose on the plane. But when the plane starts to take off, they run out of runway and the plane crashes. Well, everyone survived. And then when they came to, one of the hunters looks around and says, hey, where are we, eh? Uh, to which the other hunter replied, oh, I'd say about 200 meters from where we crashed last year. <laughs> so, so, you know, so this is, you know, this is one of these things that, you know, when we're, when we're talking about this, it's a, one of these typical stories where apparently they, they just didn't learn their lesson. And uh, I mean, they could have died, but uh, that's, you know, that's, that's uh, kind, of the, kind of the thing that, uh, that, that we always bring up. But at the end of the day, I mean, in, in, in manufacturing, I've seen this happening uh, in, in, the, in a couple of companies. I, I'll note one uh, specific story uh, that I don't think was funny, actually, uh, working with a team of engineers and, uh, uh, that were responsible for building equipment for a company. And almost every project they built, the machines were unreliable. They weren't making repeatable, stable processes. They were, uh, we actually called them uh, called them out saying, you, all you're doing is building machines to build scrap. And uh, it, it just, it was just crazy until they started doing the lessons learned uh, and, and found out what the, tip, you know, what the issues were that things started to improve. But it, it was just, you know, just doing the same, doing the same and, uh, and, and building machines the same way and thinking the same way until they did lessons learned and, uh, and, it, and the story changed for the better. Wow. That's kind of scary when you think about it to repeat and repeat and repeat. Yeah. And yeah. like making machines to create scrap that. Yeah. <laughs> that's, yeah. That's very not sad. really very good. Right. So no, how can this sad. whole whole process be done actually simply and easily because each project is a series of tasks. You want to identify the valuable lessons learned through the process. So how do you go about cataloging that? Well, a couple a couple of things. So look, every project, as you say, is a series of, of, of steps and, and, and tasks. And actually in project management per se, there is, there is a lessons learned module. It's just that people don't take the time, as I mentioned before, make, they don't take the time, they don't make the effort often to actually do the lessons learned. Uh, and even if, if, you know, if you're not into a very uh, strict project management regimen, uh, there's a simple process that, that uh, I've actually facilitated for, uh, for companies, which is uh, just gathering the teams, having them write out on sticky notes or on, on flashcards individually what they thought went well. Uh, and separately, they want, you want them to uh, write down separately what they think uh, didn't go so well that could have gone better. And you want them to do it individually, independently, so that you can avoid groupthink. We then facilitate, or anybody can facilitate them coming together in groups of, you know, five, maybe six. You don't want to go above six, in smaller groups of about six, and then have them, each of them, participate by giving what they thought went well, having the conversation and asking why they think it went well. It's as easy as that. It's, it's you know, it's one of these things that is very simple. It does take some time. You know, a session could take maybe a couple hours, but what's a couple hours invested? Uh, when, when you can, you know, gain that um, easily with, uh, with what you learn. Uh, and the biggest, the, the, the good questions, the, the better questions there are the whys, because the whys are where you're going to get the mindset. What was actually the, 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 the systemic, what are the systemic issues, the underlying issues, both good and bad, that you want to repeat when it's, when it's the good, and that you want to avoid when it's the bad. 
So it's really simple lessons. Uh, it's almost like a five why session uh, with a different focus. So, so that, that portion, that part of uh, lessons learned, that part of knowledge capture is, uh, is pretty simple. And why is it so important to do this right away when a project is just completed, besides from the simple idea that everything is kind of fresh in your mind? Yeah, and, and yes, and that is, by the way, what you mentioned. It's fresh in your mind, it's recent, that, and that's important because cause and effect are, are very close uh, in time. So it's easy to recognize things. But often teams are going to disband. Uh, so you have a team, a project team, uh, today, and they disband after the project is done. This means that people go off to take part in other projects, and then you lose the opportunity to actually um, reflect on, on these two questions, what went well and what could have gone better. Um, and so it, it's, it, 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 by doing it right away, you start building in uh, the big D word. The big D word is discipline. And this is, this is the, you know, the, 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 the discipline to actually put it into practice uh, in, every, uh, in every project. And by the way, it's not only at the end of the project. It should be at every phase of the project. You could do lessons learned and capture knowledge at the beginning, at the middle, and of course at the end. So there's opportunities there. But that, you know, the main, the main reason is that today, you know, you're going to have a teammate of X you know, some people that are going to just move, move away and you want to make sure that you uh, capture the knowledge while they're still there and while it's fresh. You mentioned, you know, using flashcards or sticky notes when they have this, this meeting to, to, you know, break down how the whole project went. I'm curious mm -hmm. to know among those five or six people that you say participate, mm -hmm. do they generally all agree or is it? No, no, yeah, no. Yeah. Okay. No, they don't agree. And that's the, that's the whole point. You know, you want to have that conversation. They, yeah, you, you're going to, you know, you're going to have people challenging each other. And you know what the biggest, I guess the, 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 the key is to make sure that you're challenging people so that they're addressing facts, not, um, you know, not just opinions and hearsay, but actually, you know, you're asking, where did you see that? When did that happen? Show me the data. You know, it's, it's, it's really challenging them to make sure that they're, they're, they're putting factual things on there. Uh, observed information. When did it happen? Where did it happen? Um, and so, yes, they don't agree. But if you can provide the where and when, then you, you have a convincing way of, of saying, yeah, it, it is something to learn from. So that's a, that's a good, good question, uh, Janet. Yeah. I'm thinking about, you know, when, when we're trying to, to do knowledge management, I think one of the things where people or companies rather really lose knowledge is when a person is retiring or leaving a company. Do many companies actually have a career debrief with people who are exiting to cover that vast array of knowledge that they have that would be leaving the company? Yeah, and I, you asked, you know, if it's many companies. I, I can't say, I don't have the statistics to say, yeah, your name. My experience, not. Um, mm -hmm. But that's just, you know, my experience. Where I, I've seen it happen in, in, a, in, a, in two companies uh, where I've been involved. Uh, and uh, they, you know, we've called on uh, experts that actually, from the outside, that know how to debrief uh, the people that are going to go into retirement. I and mean, we've had people that reject giving back, giving the knowledge. Um, but it's a, it's a specific type of interview. It's very, inter it's very structured. The questions are structured to ask for, you know, depending on what you're trying to gain. Uh, most of the time where I was involved, it was technical knowledge. Uh, so it was, you know, a lot of engineering uh, type of stuff that, that needed to be recorded. Specific details of a process, specific details on a product, and, uh, you know, very specialized areas. But I, I really can't say if it's if it's uh, if it's out there now. I think it's important to, to I would say it's an opportunity, and ask why why aren't we doing it? And is it is it part of our human resources effort that we need to uh, include in there and say the whole life cycle of the of of, of the employee because it's value uh, that is going to be lost. You know, it's just an asset and uh, it, it's going to be lost. So it, it's an opportunity definitely to uh, to explore. Yeah. And I, well, I, I guess ultimately uh, people who think about possibly doing that sort of thing, doing that career debrief with everybody who's exiting the company, they're going to be thinking, okay, 
what's exactly going to be gained from spending this time collecting and cataloging this information. So what do you yeah. see as that gain for a company? Oh, well, it, it, it's, uh, if, you, if you're going to just go out there and try and, uh, and learn and try and learn, that's fine. But, you know, if somewhere in your company, somebody has already, been, has, has already done it or somebody already knows how to do it or a better way of doing it, then you wouldn't be wasting the time, right? If you, have, if you had access to knowledge, you know, that, 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 uh, that, that somebody has. And, uh, you know, capturing it before somebody leaves, you make sure that you have that. You don't know if you're going to use it in the future. And uh, <laughs> it's funny, but in one of those instances, uh, the, 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 the knowledge was being, that was being captured and downloaded uh, from, from a certain individual. It was like, oh, you know, it's like, why didn't we know this before? Because we would have avoided this and that. So it's like, you know, you said hindsight 2020, right? Mm -hmm. At the beginning, and uh, it just, uh, it's amazing, the opportunity loss there. So it's, uh, I, I think it's something to look at and, uh, and promote as, uh, as, a, as almost as a leadership, uh, one of these leadership platforms and say, this is one of the things that you want to promote inside your, your company. So once you start gathering all that information and that knowledge, how do you keep it and maintain it and make it accessible to the people within the company rather than just having like technically these encyclopedias that are sitting on a shelf that nobody uses anymore. Yeah. How, do you, right, how do you get right. to that, yeah. that information so it's there? Yeah, yeah. And so that, and this is, you know, this is the information age. I mean, so we're in a much better place today uh, than we were, you mentioned encyclopedias. I mean, I, I'm a, I still remember Encyclopedia Britannica and, uh, and I think it was the World Book or something like that. Um, that I'm that old. Uh, so we're, we're actually in a good place. And so it's, it, this is, you know, to answer your question, this is work between your IT group, uh, the people in every area and, uh, interacting with all of the processes and include this as an additional process, um, in, in your company. Uh, and so what, what you're going to look at is, you know, the, this, just look at, I think it's called uh, SharePoint. I think it's, uh, is one of those, uh, typical or, or small platforms that a lot of people are using. Something as basic as SharePoint or, or a, an interactive spreadsheet that people can actually populate would be a, a beginning. The important thing is to, uh, is to agree on how to categorize the knowledge because you're going to have people searching, right? Yeah. So you have to categorize by topic, by functional area, by you know, project type, uh, you could actually, you know, it could be product process. Uh, you know, you could, you could sit down first and start categorizing how are you going to do this? The other thing is it, it, that's important is to tie it back to the people that are actually doing the input. You want to make sure that they are writing the knowledge in a way that is understandable enough, but that it can be tied back to them in case there's additional questions when somebody's actually going into the database to look for, has this been done before? tie it back to the experts so that they can connect with the experts um, and, uh, and make it very searchable. You want to, you know, and, and that's, that's the beauty of, of how, you know, Google works and all these other platforms that you just make it easy to, to search. So you, you got to, you, you, you know, that's, that's, that's what you're thinking when you're categorizing. So, um, so that, you know, those are, those are the things that, that, that you want to look at. I've seen some, uh, some uh, uh, companies do it really well. Like I said, they do it really well from the technical side. Uh, but you could use the same platforms to add all of the other, you know, the, the, uh, the values and the mindsets and uh, the communication side and, and that sort of thing into, um, into that. But it is, you know, it's an IT people process um, type of thing. And again, going back to leadership, uh, it's something for leadership to promote um, to, and, and, uh, you know, what, one thing I tell some of the people that I've coached is says, you know, ask the questions I'm asking, you know, I'm, uh, if you're a leader, ask the questions, what, you know, have you looked up to see if somebody else has done this before? And if a leader is asking that question, it starts prompting the whole team to think, Oh, well, that's something we've never done before. Uh, so let's, you know, let's start, uh, let's start um, capturing and, and working on this. So, and it's never too late.
So Yeah. So how do you actually know that this process works? Because you, you must have seen it working somewhere. Yes, yes. Actually, not too long ago, actually very recent. Uh, in a, in a, it, so th this is uh, typically, this was in a new product development R&D uh, type of environment where a company had to launch, let's call them four new uh, machines, advanced uh, type of machines. Uh, and uh, they, they, uh, they actually, we were, we were called in because when they launched the first in a series of the four, um, they experienced a very costly launch. It was expensive. There was a lot of issues with quality. They missed the, de the deadlines. Um, customers were not happy. So we came in and we did some analysis and some things, but we started doing the lessons learned for them. And uh, when they launched the second uh, machine, uh, their co the collaboration inside the company and with their vendors had improved dramatically. So they launched the second machine. It wasn't flawless, but there was less uh, scrap. They were more on time. Quality issues were about 50% reduced. Um, the workshops continued. And when they did the third machine, it was almost flawless. Very nice launch. Um, it didn't cost them a whole lot more than it should have. They were on time, quality was good. And recently they launched the fourth and that one was closest to flawless uh, execution. And all of this, or let's say a lot of this was tied back to the fact that collaboration improved, coordination improved, alignment improved uh, from a lot of the different work that, that was done in the teams. And a lot was from the lessons learned. They actually had the discipline to, uh, to uh, meet, do the lessons learned, and transfer that knowledge and share that knowledge to the other teams. Uh, so I would say that it, it, it does work. It, it's, uh, it can be very successful and uh, strongly recommended. So I can see this nicely relating um, with continuous improvement. Oh, yeah, yeah, ab absolutely. It's a part of continuous improvement. So recently uh, I recorded a, a LinkedIn learning course that is the A3, um, it's, a, it's called A3 Problem Solving. And A3 is a methodology, kind of demaic in the Six Sigma, but I like, I like the A3. It has a module at the end, uh, the eighth step, because I use an eighth step uh, A3 process uh, that actually has a lessons learned uh, feature where at the end of, the, of, the, uh, of this uh, co continuous improvement project, which is a, a problem solving project in this case, uh, there's a sharing of lessons learned uh, across the enterprise uh, uh, with everybody in the company. And, uh, and so that, that's, uh, that's one of the things that I tie back to uh, continuous improvement. And it's, you know, for me, continuous improvement is very PDCA. It's plan, do, check, act based. And uh, I do see a lot of companies doing plan, do, plan, do, uh, and they don't spend a whole lot of this time in, uh, in checking. And in checking is where the learning happens. That's where you can be uh, learning and then gaining value and adding that value into your processes. Uh, and so I, I just like to say that continue, you know, continuous improvement is too often seen as something to do on the shop floor for manufacturing, production processes. Uh, but today in manufacturing, there's projects happening everywhere. Um, you know, either developing new products, new processes, um, plant expansions. And so there's projects happening all the time. And I think that's where we could do continuous improvement by embedding and ensuring that, that, that the teams are disciplined enough to do the lessons learned uh, and, uh, and be able to then replicate the good behaviors and avoid the bad. So that's, um, you know, that's how I tie it back to, uh, to CI, to the continuous improvement. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So what are some key takeaways that you can leave with listeners who might actually like to get started on this path of knowledge management? So I would say run a pilot. You know, I love, I love um, getting people to try. And the best way to do this is just to run a pilot and don't have too many, you know, to, don't create too much expectation. Um, just say, we're working on this project. We've had these issues in the past. Let's just run a pilot and do a lessons learned. Um, 
you know, at, right after we're done and um, let's see what we can pick up on. Uh, also, anybody could take the lead. It doesn't have to be anybody specifically. Uh, it doesn't have to be the project leader. Uh, it could be anybody. It could be somebody in quality. It could be anybody in management. Uh, they could take the lead and run this and, uh, you know, and, and, and just try it because one of the things I see all of these processes do a lot is, is kind of a side benefit, which is create cross-functional team collaboration, which is missing. You know, everybody talks about silos and whatever, so you've got nothing to lose. Uh, I think there's everything to gain. Run a pilot, go online, look for these processes, um, and, and, just, uh, and just do it, and then follow the, you know, follow the lessons learned, the project, manage the project management uh, philosophy, and just follow the lessons learned process, and, uh, and just do it. It's the best way to, uh, to get in and try, and, and you'll see the benefit. I think it's really interesting because when, you know, we were talking about the career debrief and you had said, you know, a lot of companies don't do it, but there's that person who's walking out of the company with all of this information. And then you mentioned, you know, the one company saying, how come I never knew about these things? Yeah. I think if, if you have that information sitting there, you know, somebody in your, your company knows one piece of the information and another person in the other side of the company needs some has a piece of information and you bring those two people together, you could find something magical happening with those two bits of information, right? Absolutely. Absolutely. Yeah. This is, uh, that's exactly, that's exactly right. And, uh, you know, it's just, uh, uh, I would say at the end of the day, I would say it's just another source of waste if we don't do it because it's just an opportunity lost. And the other way to look at it, if, if you do do it, you could be adding value <clears throat> to your organization. So mm -hmm. it's, uh, yeah, it's, it's just, uh, it's a, it's a pity that we don't focus too much on that. And, uh, hopefully, um, we can wake up to see this opportunity and, um, and take the challenge and, and run a pilot and start, start this whole process. Yeah. I think it'd be well worth trying a pilot. Sam, thank you so much for, for taking the time to chat and to share your experience with us. I really appreciate it. My pleasure, Janet. Thank you very much for the opportunity. Oh, you're welcome. Sam Yankelevich is a continuous improvement coach. He's an author, a speaker, and a LinkedIn learning instructor. You can also check out his earlier Make It Right podcasts, number 54 and 55, where he discussed why it's so important to pay attention to how you communicate when crossing cultures and time zones. I think you'll find that one really interesting as well. That's our show this week. Please check out our Twitter and LinkedIn feeds that are on our podcast page and subscribe and share this podcast with your friends and colleagues through iTunes, Google Play, Stitcher, Spotify, and YouTube. Knowledge share this podcast. The Make It Right podcast is brought to you by Kevin Smith, leadership advisor and author of the best-selling book, Make It Right, Five Steps to Align Your Manufacturing Business from the Front Line to the Bottom Line. Until next time, I'm Janet Eastman. Thanks for listening to the Make It Right podcast.